Hi guys, welcome to Dublin. My name is Dave and I'm going to show you around a little bit of Dublin today. We're going to visit some of the iconic sites and landmarks. We begin our tour on the south bank of the River Liffey at the site of the Viking settlement and visit a church they started, Christ Church Cathedral. Next, we head to Dublin Castle, once the seat of British government and the site where the city got its name. Then we take a short stroll to Temple Bar, one of Dublin's nightlife hubs, before heading over to Trinity College and a walk down Grafton Street. Grafton Street will take us to St. Stephen's Green, one of the city's great urban parks, before we walk up Dawson Street to see Mansion House, where the mayor resides. And finally, we enter Merrion Square to pay a visit to the Oscar Wilde statue, and then ending at Leinster House, the seat of the Irish Parliament. And we're here right now in what we would call ancient Dublin, or if you like, Viking Dublin. Let's turn the camera around, and here we have this Viking ship. And this was a replica of a ship that was built over 900 years ago by the Vikings. Now, I want to cross the road here and show you exactly where the Vikings, where the Vikings arrived in the year 840. And I'm approaching the River Liffey here. The River Liffey runs through the city of Dublin. If you look further on there at this bridge, guys, that's exactly where the Vikings arrived in the year 840. And they made their settlement right here where this building, government building is, the w, Dublin City Council. This is where they, they first settled in Dublin, uh, here at this particular site and behind it. Now, we're gonna, as I said, we are in ancient Dublin. So I am gonna go up to Dublin's oldest street. The name of the street is Fishamble Street. And it gets its name because at one time in the early 1400s, right up until the 1700s, the late 1700s, there was a fish market here. Fishamble Street, as you can see there, guys, the oldest street in Dublin. There also was an open air slaughterhouse here. And back then they called open air slaughterhouses shambles. Hence the name Fishamble Street. Now, we are gonna visit Dublin's oldest house, or I should say, Dublin's oldest still standing house. And this is the house right here. I'll try and get a better view of it for you. And this is number 26 Fishamble Street. And it was built in 1720. And descendants of the same family have lived here for over 250 years. Across the road here, guys, you might notice, this is Handel's Hotel. And Handel's Hotel is named after George Frederick Handel. And the first recital of Handel's Messiah took place here on the 13th of April, 1742. And performing at Handel's Messiah was the choirs of both St. Patrick's Cathedral and Christ Church Cathedral. I'll show you the plaque on the wall here. George Handel, George Frederick Handel, the first performance of the Messiah. 1742, there's now a hotel here, as I said, named Handel's Hotel. We are going a little bit further up the road here on Fish Shamble Street, and we are now going to visit one of Dublin's oldest working building, which is Christ Church Cathedral. And you can see it right there. Christ Church Cathedral, I'm going to get a better view of it. Now, Christ Church Cathedral was established in 1028 by Viking Citric. Now, at that time, it was a wooden structure that was built on high ground looking over the Viking settlement of Wood Quay, where we just came from. Now, I'm crossing the road here, you've got to be careful. Plenty of traffic around, or a little bit of traffic around. Got to wait for the green light. So as I said, Christchurch Cathedral was originally a wooden structure in 1028, but in 1176, it was rebuilt in stone by Richard de Clare, also known as Strongbow. And Strongbow 
was a Norman warlord and his tomb lies in rest here in Christchurch Cathedral. Now in the 12th century this was a Catholic church run by Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole. Now around the year 1539 this became an Anglican church during the reign of Henry VIII and how that came about was Henry VIII had been a Catholic and he went to the Pope to ask permission or to get to grant permission for a divorce from one of his wives and he was rejected and so he decided to start his own religion and that religion was the Anglican religion and as I said this church this cathedral became an Anglican cathedral and has been ever since. Um, there's also the largest cathedral crypt in Christchurch Cathedral, the largest cathedral crypt in both Ireland and the UK and it has the oldest secular carvings of any place in the world and there's a great story about the crypt that there was a rat and a cat found in one of the organ pipes here in 1850 and their mummified remains are on display in the crypt and they're affectionately known as Tom and Jerry. So we're going to move on guys to our next destination which is Dublin Castle. We're approaching the gates to Dublin Castle, the seat of British government in Ireland for over 700 years. It was uh, first established by King John of England in the year 1204. Um, let me just show you this little courtyard here. It's called Hoey's Court. It's been many, many movies and scenes for movies been made here, including The Tudors, um, also P.S. I Love You, and scenes from Braveheart also as well. As I say, we're coming into Dublin Castle. It says right in the sign here, Welcome to Dublin Castle. And uh, so first, where we're going to go is the Dublin Gardens. And the Dublin Gardens is the location of where Dublin gets its name. It's where two rivers met, um, where the River Poddle that runs underneath this part of the city today, and also the River Liffey, which is about 500 yards to my left at this present day, and flows through the center of Dublin city. Well, them two rivers met at this spot that we're going to right now, and uh, it was a very dark pool. It was actually, uh, the Vikings used this area as their harbor in the ninth century. So it was a harbor in the ninth century with a very dark pool, or black pool, if you like. And the Irish, in the Irish language, the word for dove is, um, the Irish language word dove means black or dark. And the word Lynn means pool. So there you get the name, Dove Lynn, which was then turned into Dublin. They just dropped the H in Dove and the last N in Lynn to get Dove Lynn, Dove Lynn Gardens. So this is exactly the spot where Dublin got its name, Dublin. If you look further over here, you'll see the round tower of Dublin Castle, or if you like, the record tower. Um, this is a very famous landmark here in Dublin Castle. It was the, uh, it was originally a prison and supposedly an inescapable prison, but two Irishmen escaped from here in the year 1583. They were Red Hugh O'Donnell and uh, a Gaelic, the Lord, the son of a Gaelic Lord from County Donegal and Art O'Neill, who was also the son of a Gaelic Lord from County Tyrone. They were imprisoned here for their activities against the British Crown. And somehow, in the depths of winter, in January 1583, they escaped from a rope from the top of the tower down to the basement, and they made their way out through a drain into the river puddle 
and swam their way to safety. Now, unfortunately for Art O'Neill, later he said succumbed to the conditions and he died. But Red Hood Hugh O'Donnell survived. He lost a couple of toes through uh, frostbite, but other than that he was fine. And he became a real thorn in the side of the British authorities for many years to come, having staged the Nine Year War. And uh, he also got help from the Spanish Armada as well. If you look at this uh, lovely church here, it's called the Chapel Royal. And this Chapel Royal was uh, used for the representative of the King in Dublin Castle for over 700 years. And they were known as the Lord Lieutenant or Viceroy. And inside the church you have the names of every single Viceroy and Lord or Lord, Lord Lieutenant, if you like, from the year 1204, right up until when Ireland got its independence in 1922. The church was built in 1807. We are coming up now to <coughs> the courtyard of Dublin Castle. And this courtyard has seen many events throughout the years. Uh, most notably, as I said, in 1922, when Ireland got its independence from Britain, there was a ceremony, a handing over ceremony, giving the keys back to the Irish people of Dublin Castle. And uh, the story goes, the leader of Ireland at the time was Michael Collins, and the ceremony was to take place around 12 p.m. that day and uh, on the 6th of December 1922, but Collins was late. He was seven minutes late, and the Lord Lieutenant was furious that Collins was late, and he said to him, Collins, how dare you be late for this ceremony? You're seven minutes late. And Collins replied back to him, seven years, seven minutes, you can have your seven minutes, we've been waiting 700 years. Now these are the state apartments. They're beautiful, luxurious rooms. Beautifully furnished, beautiful and fantastic uh, uh, sculptures within the building and paintings and so forth. But the most celebrated room in here is St. Patrick's Hall. And St. Patrick's Hall is where they have all the state dinners for over 200 years. Uh, some of the notable people that have come or dignitaries have come for their state dinner here was John F. Kennedy. In June of 1963, just five months before his assassination, Queen Elizabeth II came here to Dublin Castle for a state dinner, and it had been our first time ever in Ireland, and that was only in 2011. And then Princess Grace has been here before, and uh, the last celebrity, if you like, that was here was only just three years ago, and that was Pope Francis. So we're going to leave. Dublin Castle now and we're going to make our way down to the lovely riverside neighbourhood of Temple Bar. Folks were walking by down the uh, cobblestone streets of Temple Bar, a very very popular area here in Dublin, especially among tourists. And uh, if you look right over here to my right you'll see uh, sorry to my left you'll see the Clarence Hotel Clarence Hotel is partially owned by Bono and the Edge from U2 and uh, it's an amazing fact of how they came to own this hotel this is the back entrance to it but what happened was when there were teenagers just starting out they were doing a gig around town and they were to meet friends back at this hotel they came in and the bartender refused them uh, service as maybe they were a little bit scruffy looking, seeing they were band members. But on the way out, Bono turned around and said to the bartender, he said, the next time we'll be back here, we will own this pub. And true to his word, 15, 20 years later, he bought the pub, he bought the hotel. Today, he, he, they did own it outright, but today they own a 50% share in it. So we're in Temple Bar here, as I said, guys, this is the number one tourist attraction in Dublin, a lovely riverside community, uh, full of great 
bars, restaurants, and also boutique, boutique stores that uh, mostly carry Irish produced products, such as arts and crafts and such. Um, now, Temple Bar gets its name from Sir William Temple, an English man who arrived here in Dublin in 1609. And we are in what would have been his gardens, because he had a mansion here, and all of this land around Temple Bar belonged to him. He was also the provost of Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland's most recognised and renowned university, and uh, from 1609 to up until his death in uh, 1627. As I say, lovely cobblestone scone streets of Temple Bar, nice area. They have music going on in all the bars from 11 a.m. right up until the early hours of the morning. Now it is a very expensive uh, area in Dublin to have a few drinks and to have something to eat. This is the main bar here in Temple Bar and obviously it's called Temple Bar. And here is Sir William Temple, the man that this area of Dublin is known, as, known after, Sir William Temple. We'll move on a little bit more through Temple Bar and we're going to head off up the street a little. So I'm here on Nassau Street and uh, we're walking down uh, beside the walls of Trinity College and uh, we'll be visiting Trinity College just in a few minutes but as I do that, as we walk, let me tell you a little bit about Trinity College Dublin. So Trinity College was founded in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth I who was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and the last of the Tudor monarchs. Now, this uh, university consists of 47 acres and some of Dublin's most iconic buildings and landmarks. One of these iconic landmarks is the Campernel, or if you like, the uh, bell tower. And suspicion has it that if you walk through the bell tower or the Campernel, during exam times, while the bells are ringing, you will fail your exams. Now, the most important and most famous building within this 47 acre campus is the old library. And the old library houses the famous Book of Kells. Now the Book of Kells was written in the year 800 by a group of monks, first of all, on the island of Iona, off the coast of Scotland, and, and it was completed in Kells in County Mead, just outside of Dublin, about 40 minutes drive away. Now, it was written on vellum from the skin of 130 calves, and it took over 100 years to complete. It was found in the 12th century in Kells Abbey, and it's been on display here in the Lowell Library since 1850. So a really, really iconic uh, thing. It's also considered, the Book of Kells is considered to be the world's most important medieval manuscript. Now the university here is uh, a global or international university as regards students. More than half of the students are from foreign countries, uh, especially the likes of Asia and uh, other parts of the world like that, in, uh, India, some Americans and so forth as well. But uh, very, very international and uh, it is Ireland's top university and of course Ireland's oldest university. As I said, it was established in 1592. Lots of famous um, people have been students here, including Oscar Wilde, Samuel Beckett, um, George Bernard Shaw, just to mention a few, and also Ireland's first ever president, Douglas Hyde. Now we are going further up here, and uh, we are approaching College Green, so I just want to show you the front of the front entrance to Trinity College. Unfortunately, during these times of COVID, Everything is locked up, so 
we cannot go in there at this present time. But as we walk, we're coming up on the left-hand side to the uh, Irish Whiskey Museum. And uh, there's a big craze on right now, not just in Dublin, but throughout Ireland with whiskey. And lots and lots of new brands have been uh, distilled in the last few years, last 10, 12 years. About 20 years ago, there was five distilleries in Ireland. Today, there's over 100 new brands of whiskey, or many of them are new brands. So that's the Irish Whiskey Museum. There's uh, altogether five whiskey museums in the city of Dublin. Well worth a visit. As you see, this uh, is the Dublin Tram, and uh, it's basically called the Lewis, and it runs from the, north, from the city centre out through the Dublin suburbs of north and south. So we'll give you a shot at the world famous, Dublin's most iconic and sacred university, Trinity College. There's just a view of it there for you guys. Plenty of action going around today. The ambulances are out in force. If you look over here at this building right here, guys, that's the old Parliament building. It was established in 1729 and was the seat of the Irish House of Commons and the Irish House of Lords. It, uh, it ceased to be a Parliament in 1800 with the Act of Union and uh, all Irish affairs were then to be conducted in Westminster. And uh, since 1803, it's been a bank, still a bank today, the Bank of Ireland. We are heading off now, guys, and uh, folks, and we are going to visit Ireland's most visited statue. There's got to be hundreds of statues and, and uh, monuments and busts all across Dublin. But this one that we're going to visit is the most famous of those and the most visited. And uh, it's called the Molly Malone statue. And Molly Malone was a fishman monger who lived in Dublin in the late 1600s, mid to late 1600s. And in 1699, she died of a fever. But she was a fishmonger who wheeled her wheelbarrow through streets broad and narrow, crying cockles and mussels, alive, alive-o. Now this statue was put here to commemorate Dublin's millennium when it was a thousand years old in 1988. Well, as I say, the most visited site the most visited statue in all of Dublin is the Molly Malone statue. There's a great song that uh, was recorded of Molly Malone. I just sang a little bit or talked a little bit to you about it there, but uh, very famous. So that's Molly Malone. All right, guys, we're walking down and we are going to head to Grafton Street, which is Ireland's most fashionable street. So if you're enjoying the tour so far, why don't you go ahead and click that like button and help others discover this video. And if you would like to watch more walking tour videos like this one, then also consider subscribing to our channel and click that notification bell so that you don't miss any new videos. In addition to walking tour videos, we also offer travel tips as well as videos covering day trips. And if you have any place that you would like to see us offer a video tour of, then leave your suggestions in the comments section below. And lastly, if you'd like to buy your tour guide a pint or a cup of coffee links to do so are also in the description below now back to the tour all right folks we're here on grafton street which is uh, dublin's most fashionable street and uh, we're moving on up and if you look ahead of us here we have weir's jewelers it's been here since 1869 and uh, one of dublin's most iconic shops uh, definitely the lead leading a uh, jewellery store in Dublin. And if you look further here with that green awning there, where this is uh, Brown Thomas. And Brown Thomas is Ireland's most fashionable store. It's got 37 of the world's leading brand name stores and uh, within the building. And it's like our equivalent, Dublin's equivalent to Harrods, if you like. All the big players are here. 
all the big fashion icons have stores within this building. If you look over here to the left, that's Brown Thomas building. Or sorry, that is uh, the Marks and Spencer's building. A British company that's been here for many years, lots of locations throughout the country. And um, there is a really nice rooftop uh, cafe up top where you can see and look down on the streets of Grafton Street and other streets while you're enjoying your cup of coffee or your lunch. We're moving on guys and uh, as I say, Grafton Street is usually full of people and lots of buskers out to play uh, their music. In fact, the guys from U2 played here in the late 70s when they were starting out and uh, there's many other buskers that play on this street, including a young lady by the name of Ali Sherlock. She's been playing here since she was 12 years old and she is a big player on YouTube, if you look at our video, she's probably 15, 16 now. And she was also featured on The Ellen Show. If you look over here to my right, this is Beaulieu's Oriental Cafe. And this was set up in 1840 and is Dublin's oldest coffee shop. It was uh, founded by a Quaker family, the Beaulieu's. And uh, at one time, it was the only coffee shop in Dublin. And in 1970, they made this coffee shop into a co-op where each member of staff became a shareholder or a stakeholder. And so even the waitress that was serving you your breakfast or your lunch had a stake and was part owner of the company. Thought that was really neat. Um, we're moving on up here at Grafton Street. As I say, lots of designer stores on this street. Very expensive street, probably Dublin's most expensive street. If you want to buy something here on this street, you want to have a little bit of cash. There's plenty of jewellery stores, and I say fashion stores too. I want to move in and show you uh, another statue of a real famous person in Irish history. And uh, before there was U2, before there was the Boom Tom Rats, there was Thin Lizzy. And this is the man that was the lead singer of Thin Lizzy. And uh, that's Phil Linnett. Phil Linnett's statue. A great uh, musician. Unfortunately, he died very, very young. At the tender age of 36. But uh, he brought, he was the founder, if you like, of Irish rock and roll music. If it wasn't for him, there would be no U2. He paved the way for the rest of the great bands coming out of Ireland in the uh, late 70s, 80s. This is McDade's pub, famous pub for literary folk. In fact, uh, two men um, of the literary world who used to drink together here, uh, and that was Patrick Kavanagh, a poet, and Brendan Behan, a novelist, a writer, uh, a playwright, um, used to drink here. They, they worked for a publication just around the corner called Envoy. <clears throat> they were the best of friends at one time. One time they had a big scrap, big fight in this pub. Boat or Bard could never come back again. But uh, as I say, lots of things happen on Grafton Street, on and off Grafton Street. That beautiful church down the end there is St. Anne's Church. It was uh, first established in 1707 and it's where Bram Stoker, the guy that um, wrote Dracula, he was married in that church to Francis Balcom, who happened to be Oscar Wilde's girlfriend. And uh, himself and Oscar Wilde, Stoker, were good friends, but I think they had fallen out over the girlfriend. So we're coming up to the top of Grafton Street here, and uh, we are going to go along Stevens Green in just a minute. All right, folks, we're on Stevens Green here. I just want to turn your attention to these red brickings over here. And uh, that is the home to Dublin's, the little museum of Dublin, an award-winning museum uh, full of history of Dublin, all the way back from medieval times up until the present day. 
They even have an exhibition room dedicated to the great Irish band U2 and uh, definitely well worth a visit as it is known as one of the best museums in Dublin. We're making our way, as I say, we're on Stephen's Green. Stephen's Green is the oldest of the five Georgian uh, squares of Dublin. Uh, founded in 1663, as I say. And, uh, you know, Georgian Dublin gets its name from the reign of King George I in 1712, right up to the end of the reign of King George IV in 1830. And we are going into one of, well, the, in my opinion, the nicest city park in Dublin, and maybe one of the nicest city parks anywhere in the world. This is Stevens Green Park. And uh, as I say, st established in 1663 for the residents of Marion Square. But in 1880, a man by the name of Lord Ardalon, or if you like, uh, Edward, sorry, Arthur Guinness, and he was the grandson or the great grandson of the founder of the Guinness um, Brewery Company. And he also was the owner of the Brewery Company himself for, for a time. But he bought the lease from the residents in 1880 and established this park and opened it free to the public. And uh, he was very much a philanthropist and helped the poor people of Dublin and the homeless in Dublin. And uh, we're going to go visit his monument now in a minute or two. I'm going to say it's a lovely city park. Uh, some really nice views, a great place to come for uh, tourists, locals and lots of business people in the area will come here and admire the, the beautiful gardens whilst having their lunch. And it was Lord Ardern himself in 1880 that designed the gardens here and he lived himself on the uh, south end of Stephen's Green Square. Um, lots of beautiful trees and everything else about. Now, if you go through the Stevens Green Park here, you'll see lots of busts, monuments, and, uh, and statues of very, very well-known Irish people, from revolutionaries to politicians, um, to writers, and other such scholars. Now, in 1916, there was a big, uh, Easter Rising here, the uh, Easter Rebellion, if you like, in 1916. And uh, on the Irish side, they were made of a mostly um, volunteer armies. One of these volunteer armies was uh, the Irish Citizen Army. And the man in command of that post, which their post was right here at Stevens Green, was Michael Mallon. But his second in command, was a lady by the name of Constance Gore Booth, otherwise known as Countess Markovich. So she was second in command. And uh, obviously it was a failed rebellion after six days. The Irish contingent of the Irish, uh, of the East Horizon surrendered and all the leaders were executed. Countess Markovich was due to be executed, but as she was a woman, it was then um, commuted to life imprisonment, but she only served a little over a year, or not even a year. And, it, and in uh, 1918, she became a politician and also was the first woman ever to be elected to Westminster. Uh, she was part of the Irish party of Sinn Féin. Um, now, she never actually attended Westminster. Instead, she continued her political activities here at home in Dublin. And in fact, she was an English woman originally, and she was uh, educated in England and uh, lived in England. But her family had a summer home in County Sligo on the west coast of Ireland. And each year as a teenager that she came here, she fell more in love of the, with the beautiful country of Ireland and became very sympathetic with the cause for Irish freedom. I'm looking straight here, guys, at the College, uh, College of Surgeons in Dublin. This is one of the most renowned College of Surgeons 
in the world, established in the 1600s. It's represented by over 60 different countries and uh, a very, very, very famous College of Surgeons and renowned around the world. Uh, Oscar Wilde's father was a student here and he was the leading eye and ear surgeon of his day here in Dublin. Here's the man himself, Lord Ardalan, that opened, that bought the lease and opened this park up to the public in 1880. Now, um, when he died, the, um, because of his activities with the poor people of Dublin, it wasn't the Guinness family that paid for this monument, the statue. It wasn't the government of Ireland that paid for it. But in fact, it was the poor people of Dublin that paid for this monument in recognition to Lord Ardalan Arthur Guinness for his contribution to the poor people and his dedication to the poor people and the homeless people of Dublin. Okay, folks, we're on Dawson Street here and we are going to go a little bit further up this street and uh, have a look at the Mansion House. Uh, Dawson Street is also another very, very fashionable street here in Dublin, full of really uh, quirky restaurants and pubs. It was developed in the early 1700s by Joshua Dawson, and he, in fact, designed many of the streets in this area, including Grafton Street, but uh, also he designed this beautiful building that we're going to next, which is the Mansion House. And the Mansion House was first uh, established in 1710, and it's the home to the Lord Mayor of Dublin ever since 1710. The most famous of these Lord Mayors was Daniel O'Connell, known as Ireland's liberator, or uh, Catholic emancipator. And uh, he was a politician and lawyer who spent his whole working life for the good of the Irish people and was considered one of the first great civil rights leaders of the world, trying to get equal rights for Irish Catholics here in Ireland. So here's the mansion house. And today, the Lord Mayor of Dublin is a lady by the name of Hazel Chu. And her, her parents are from Hong Kong. So Dublin today and all across Ireland is a very diverse nation with uh, immigrants from all corners of the world. Beautiful, beautiful building. And if you see up the top there, underneath the Irish flag in the middle, you have the Dublin coat of arms, which has been the Dublin coat of arms for over 400 years. Three chimneys burning, or if you like, uh, three watchtowers. Okay, we're moving on. We're here in Merrion Square Park, and on Merrion Square, it's uh, the second oldest of the five Georgian squares in Dublin, and it was established in 1762 by Lord Mer Maud Fitzwilliam of Merrion. Now, we're to visit the iconic Oscar Wilde statue. Oscar Wilde grew up here in uh, Merrion Square. He was born in uh, 1854 at number one Merrion Square, the first house ever built on the square. Where I'll actually show you his house in a minute. But Oscar Wilde uh, was a very learned man, one of the great scholars in Irish literature and British literature. And he won a scholarship from his boarding school to Trinity College, Dublin just down the street that you've seen earlier. And uh, after two years, he won a fur scholarship to Oxford University in Oxford. And uh, whilst there, he befriended a lot of the socialite people of British society. And from that was invited to a lot of parties and uh, many social clubs where he'd gather all the people around in the club to tell them stories on Irish folklore. So he was already a big hit before he ever wrote a book, before he ever wrote a poem or a play. And uh, we're coming up to his monument right now. And uh, this monument was designed, or the sculptor was uh, Danny Osborne, a Scottish sculptor, and was unveiled in 
1997 by Oscar Wilde's grandson Merlin Holland. It's a beautiful statue and uh, the statue, the monument, has him facing, I'll turn around here, his childhood home here. Number one, Marion Square, the first home to ever be built on Marion Square. He lived here with his father, Lord, um, Sir William Wilde, and his mother, Lady Jane Wilde. His father was the leading pioneer surgeon of his time in the mid 1800s, and his mother was a poet and a story writer who wrote for a publication called The Nation here in Dublin at the time. And uh, she was the big influence on Oscar's career. As she, she used to run salons here where the who's who of Dublin society would come along and listen to the stories of Lady Jane Wilde. And she had an enormous uh, wit about her and she had great conversation skills. So, um, but she was prone to exaggeration, but she always maintained, never let fact get in the way of a good story. So right here, this is Oscar's wife, Lady Constance Lloyd. And uh, Oscar was married to her for several years. They had two, two boys, but he soon go, grew bored of married life after about three or four years and uh, got involved in a homosexual relationship with the Boise Lord Alfred Douglas. This sculptor right here, or this little uh, bust, is uh, Dionysus, the god of wine and theatre. Oscar was very much fond of his wine. Now, if you look down here, these are quotes. Oscar Wilde's quotes, he had many, many of them. My favourite is, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. But probably his most famous quote is, when he travelled to America, he was at the customs and he was asked, do you have anything to declare? He said, I have nothing to declare but my genius. So we'll give you one more last look at the Oscar Wilde statue and we'll move on to Leinster House. Okay, folks, we're on uh, Merrion Street here. Merrion Street is where most of the government buildings of Dublin, of Ireland, are uh, located. And uh, also, if you look, at this building here. This is the Merion Hotel, five-star hotel. It also houses Ireland's number one restaurant, which is Patrick Gibo restaurant. It's a two-star Michelin restaurant. But um, the Duke of Wellington was actually born in this hotel when it was then a townhouse, belonging to his father. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, as you may know, was Arthur Wellesley and won many, many battles and uh, including the battle against Napoleon at Waterloo, where he defeated Napoleon. Now, if you look at, uh, we're going to down Merrion Road towards Merrion Square, and uh, I want to show you the seat of government, the seat of Irish government here, which is known as Leinster House. This building here in front of me is the office of the Taoiseach, which is basically, uh, the Taoiseach in the Irish language means leader or prime minister. And that's his building where he resides right there. The Taoiseach at this present time is uh, Michal Martin. And uh, as I say, we want to show you the uh, Leinster House, uh, a beautiful house that was founded in 1745 by Lord Leinster. His name was James Fitzgerald. He was one of the richest and uh, a big uh, landowner and entrepreneur, if you like, businessman in Dublin back in the mid 1700s. And uh, he had 15 children. One of his children was Lord Edward Fitzgerald, a revolutionary leader who was executed for his role in the 1798 rebellion against the British Crown. So here, I'm gonna turn my attention or your attention, folks, to Leinster House. We'll cross the road here in a minute and let you have a look at it. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. And in fact, I don't know if you know, but the White House was designed by an Irishman named James Hoban from County Kilkenny. And he modeled 
the White House in Washington DC on this very building. Sorry we can't go in due to the restrictions of the age that we're living in right now. We can't go in but there is the beautiful Leinster House. Now this is the back entrance to Leinster House. There is a, another entrance. Uh, the front entrance is on uh, Dawson Street. Equally as beautiful a building from the front as it is from the back. So this would be considered uh, you know, Georgian Dublin, a Georgian estate. Uh, today it's been the government of Ireland since 1922 when Ireland first got its independence. Um, there's a really, really nice, the nice, nicest, probably the nicest uh, museum in Dublin. Dublin has 43 museums and uh, most of them are free to enter, uh, to take a look at, including this one here, which is basically our, the National Museum of Ireland. This is it right here. This is just, uh, once again, the back entrance to it. And the front entrance is uh, also on Dawson Street, as is Leinster House's front entrance. Beautiful museum, it's uh, a, the history museum, uh, archaeology museum, even has a dead zoo in there too. So guys, uh, folks, that's my tour of Dublin today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, down the bottom there, you'll see uh, you could leave me a tip or buy me a cup of coffee. Um, and uh, subscribe to Free Tours on Foot and check out some of the other great videos from cities around the world. It's out for me. Thanks very much, guys. My name is Dave. And uh, if you enjoyed it, you can uh, make a comment down below also. And if you didn't enjoy it, my name is Michael.